it's a pleasure to have Chiara Mingarelli uh, from the University of Connecticut and the Flatiron Institute. And she's going to talk about uh, um, future prospects and present uh, exciting results from Pulsar Timing Arrays. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I've also tried to keep my short, uh, my, my talk short because I saw on the schedule that you have an aperitivo after this. So I don't wanna be the one who uh, prevents you from having a spritz. So here we go. Sorry, we, we've already started drinking from the morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I were there with you. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it in person. Um, okay, so first of all, I just wanna thank all of my collaborators and funding agencies. Um, without all of these people, this work really wouldn't be possible. So we've had a lot of talks today about um, exotic physics or things that I think of as being very exotic and extremely interesting. Um, this talk is gonna be mostly based on supermassive black hole binary systems, which trace galaxy mergers. However, in nanograv right now, there is a really marked deficit of people with expertise in super radiance, for example, um, Masha, I've already started composing a very long email to you about all of the ideas I have on how we can apply super radiance to pulsar timing uh, again and even more. And, uh, and Geraldine gave a really nice overview, um, again, of primordial gravitational wave backgrounds and coupling in um, those kinds of constraints with nanograv. So if you have some ideas that you would like us to explore, please let me know. Um, we don't publish many papers on those theories, mostly because we don't have anyone to write those papers, not because we're not interested in writing those papers. Uh, so please do reach out to me. Um, or if you if you have a local pulsar timing person, I know uh, in Europe, there's a lot of uh, really important people doing work there in Nerico Barausa, for example, Stas Babak, Antoine Petitot. Um, reach out to any of us who are really interested in working with you. So for the experts in the room, I'm going to uh, fast forward my talk to give you the punchline up front, and then you can see how we get there. Uh, the gravitational wave background should be detected now-ish. Um, I'll give myself a five-year error bar just in case. Afterwards, we expect to detect continuous gravitational waves five years after the background, or perhaps 10 years from now. After we can detect the individual sources that emit these continuous gravitational waves, we will likely be sensitive to anisotropy in the gravitational wave background, uh, and then we'll more or less be in the LISA era. So I'm going to start you off with locating us in the gravitational wave um, parameter space. We have ground-based detectors that we've heard a lot about today, so LIGO. Here you're sensitive to black holes of masses of uh, a few to tens of solar masses. There's one interesting intermediate mass black hole now. In the LISA band, um, you're in the millihertz regime. Here you have the baby supermassive black hole binaries, so 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar masses, and also extreme mass ratio in spirals. Those are also very cool. Um, but we're really going to focus today on pulsar timing arrays, which are at the very low frequency end um, of the gravitational wave parameter space. And so here with pulsar timing, we expect to detect the stochastic background imminently. Now I have an IPTA curve here and an SKA curve here, um, but really we're, in, we're interested in individual supermassive black hole binary systems and also the incoherent superposition of all of these very slowly evolving supermassive black hole binary systems, which generate this stochastic background. So I want to emphasize that pulsar timing arrays are far from being transient. Um, our sources stay in band for tens of millions of years. If you have an equal mass, 10 to the 9, supermassive black hole binary system, it takes 25 million years for it to evolve from 1 to 100 nanohertz, which is the pulsar timing array band. So these sources are not going anywhere. And it makes our experiment extremely challenging because you need long baselines to make the first detection. But once you have a source in band, it's going to be in band for, uh, for many, many, many lifetimes. 
So uh, given that you are already drinking, I'm going to share the story of how this uh, Mingarelli Mingarelli paper was written. Number two is Mingarelli Sr., who's a mathematician. And when I was trying to describe my experiment to him, was very uh, dubious about a numerical approximation that I was making when I was solving an equation. And so at Christmas and over many bottles of wine, we had a big argument and then found a solution, wrote a paper, and I said, well, Papa, no one is going to cite this paper unless there's a nice figure in it. And so I made this figure and stuck it in that paper. So uh, that's the origin of this figure here. So um, because it's late on a Friday for you, let's get stuck in with an animation. Here we have two galaxies. Each galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center, hopefully with clouds of axions around them uh, and lots of super radiance, but that's for another day. These two supermassive black holes are 10 to the eight to 10 to the nine solar masses. And they are separated by milliparsecs, a fraction of a light year. Now, as they are orbiting each other, they are creating these ripples in the fabric of space time. They're being emitted in all directions. And some of those gravitational waves will make their way to the Milky Way galaxy, where my colleagues are doing an excellent job of timing these millisecond pulsars. So these pulsars are the best clocks in the galaxy. And their arrival times are almost perfect. They're good to within a few hundred nanoseconds over a decade. And so if their signals arrive early or late, you can say, well, that's really funny, just in one pulsar. But if you have a whole array of pulsars whose signals are arriving early and then late and then early and then late, you can start to do some astrophysics with it. So these millisecond pulsars are our gravitational wave detectors. And uh, right now in the International Pulsar Timing Array, we have 65 millisecond pulsars. So if you see a glitch just in one pulsar, that could really be anything, right? These are objects you know, that are still the area, um, a very active area of research that are being studied. So <clears throat> if you see a signal in just one pulsar, really, I mean, you can apply your favorite theory. But if you have a correlated signal in all of your pulsars, then we have some predictions about how to say um, that that's coming from gravitational waves. So the International Pulsar Timing Array combines, um, it used to be eight radio telescopes, but now we have some junior members in the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, we have in North America, we now use the VLA and CHIME, in addition to uh, the Green Bank Telescope. And we used to use Arecibo, um, but now we use Arecibo's archival data. Um, in Europe, we have Effelsberg, Lovell, Nasse, Westerbork, and uh, our favorite place to go to meetings in Europe is the Sardinia Radio Telescope. One of our new members is Meerkat. So there's a South African pulsar timing array, and Meerkat's been doing some really excellent precision pulsar timing. In India, there's the Indian Pulsar Timing Array, and they use GMRT. In China, there's FAST, and Parks is one of the founding members of the IPTA together with Europe um, and North America, and they have the Parks Pulsar Timing Array. So as I said earlier, it takes a long time to look for these gravitational wave signals. Right. If the stochastic background is at, you know, a few nanohertz, it means that you have to look for some for a large time span because your sensitivity at that frequency goes like one over your total observing time. And so it takes 10 years to get to three nanohertz, 30 years to get to one nanohertz. So these are very long uh, term timing campaigns. So people started looking for the gravitational wave background using nanograv. Um, as early as, you know, the late 2004, and the experiment has continued until today. So what we're looking here, what we're looking at here are the residuals of a pulsar called 1713 plus 0747. And one thing that's really handy about the, whoops, no, oh, there we go, about the pulsar naming conventions is that it tells you where it is on the sky. So the first part of the name is right ascension, and the second part is declination. 
So this figure here is the residual, which is the expected minus the actual arrival time. And this is where we should be able to see gravitational wave signals. Now, the way that we do that is that we cross correlate all of the pulsar residuals. So this SAB is the cross power spectral density between pulsar A and pulsar B. So when I go through my data and I cross correlate all of these timing residuals, there are two things that should jump out. Number one is the characteristic strain, which gives you a sort of amplitude of the gravitational wave background squared. And the second thing is this angular correlation function. Now, there are some that are predicted by general relativity, and then there are extensions of this, which are also really interesting that I'll mention later. Now, you might say, well, that's interesting, but you only have 65 pulsars. What if you run out of pulsars? Well, in fact, there are currently about 2,300 known pulsars. 10% of them are millisecond pulsars, but there could be 30,000 more that are detectable. Our whole galaxy can be transformed into a gravitational wave detector. So I'm going to focus my talk uh, next on these two quantities, because as I said, the gravitational wave signal is in the residuals. You find it by cross-correlating all of the pulsars. You should get two things. You should get the characteristic strain, and you should get this angular correlation function. So let's start with the characteristic strain. You're probably used to seeing this beautiful animation from LIGO from GW150914, and then also I know they made some for subsequent detections. But this um, shows you just the very last part of the gravitational wave signal. Now, this is really impressive. But our signal comes from the in spiral and not from the chirp. And it's not just from one of these sources, but it's from the entire population of supermassive black hole binary systems in the universe. So the characteristic strain is a function of the supermassive black hole binary population, which is this, well, I guess for you guys, this doesn't look complicated, but I get a lot of pushback when I show this equation in talks. Um, this tells you the supermassive black hole binary population as a function of black hole mass, redshift, and mass ratio Q. Um, you, the way that you transform this into the characteristic strain is by saying, well, I have this DEGW by D log F term. Um, if I actually put in what that is for a circular gravitational wave in spiral, I get um, an F to the two thirds, a chirp mass to the five thirds. And again, if we assume the easiest possible scenario, this whole thing reduces to a really nice form, which gives you this power law for the characteristic strain squared that goes like F to the minus four thirds. Now, there's a few important parts of this equation, namely that the characteristic strain squared is a strong function of the black hole mass. It's almost linear in terms of the black hole mass. It is not really a strong function of cosmology. Um, but there is another important part, which is this, you know, how many sources do I have per unit of co-moving volume? So the characteristic strain, when I take the square root of this thing, you know, you can't take the square root of this double integral. So what we say is that this is an amplitude term, this whole box, everything in here, merger rates, masses, cosmology, this is A, that's the amplitude of the gravitational wave background. And when you take the square root of this, which we can even do after a few Campari spritz, um, we'll give you an F to the minus two thirds scaling. So this is our power law. Now we all have to agree to quote amplitudes at a given reference frequency or it's chaos. So we always report the amplitude at a reference frequency of one over a year. So when I say that there's an amplitude of the background, um, this is what I mean, it's, it's a constraint or maybe in the future, a detection of this term. And we assume that this evolves as a function of F to the minus two thirds, that's our power law. So for the cosmologists, you can relate this to omega GW, of course. Um, and then this is a function of the characteristic strain squared, which of course gives you this almost linear dependence on the black hole masses, which is really interesting. 
So I've just described to you this characteristic string term, which is full of astrophysics. That's delightful. And the second part is now going to be this gamma AB term or this correlation function. Um, for those of you who have dealt with LIGO and stochastic background searches, we call this the overlap reduction function. Um, but it really is just this additional correlation piece that's uh, induced by GR. So the gravitational wave background is going to leave this smoking signature in the um, pulsar pairs. So for any pulsar that's separated by, say, 30 degrees on the sky, the prediction from GR about an additional angular correlation is about 0 0.3. If you have pulsars that are almost on opposite parts of the sky, say that they're separated by 180 degrees, then the angular correlation that is expected from GR is 0 0.25, so on and so forth. The more pulsar pairs you have, the more measurements you have of this angular correlation function. Now, if you're a theorist like me, um, you've computed what all of those values should be. Right. And so you can write down exactly what this correlation function looks like for any pair of pulsars on the sky. So when we're computing, right, when we're looking for the gravitational wave background, cross correlating all of these signals, we're looking for pulsars that follow this Hellings and Downs curve. Right. That's the name of the correlation function for an isotropic and Einsteinian gravitational wave background that has some amplitude. So when we do the real search, you're going to look for this shape that has some amplitude squared of something like 10 to the minus 30. So what do we actually see in the nanograv 12 and a half year data? We've been blown away by the response um, from the community about you know, how enthusiastic people are about this first hint of the gravitational wave background. So let me walk you through what's in this um, really interesting figure. This dashed line here is at a frequency of one over a year. Now, because the pulsar um, times are transformed to the solar system very center, we have no sensitivity for periods of exactly one year. And that's because if you're at the solar system very center and you see something with a period of exactly one year, that is probably the Earth. And so we just say that we have no sensitivity at that um, at that period or at this part in the frequency space. So on the y-axis, we have the log of the residuals. And this is an amplitude spectral density. In terms of the quantities that we've already seen, it's the square root of this cross power spectral density um, divided by time. And so I don't want to confuse you by having this AB here. What we have in this figure doesn't yet inclu include the cross correlations. And so you're not going to see any kind of modulation. Um, here we're just looking for some amplitude that might be in the 45 millisecond pulsars that we timed with nanograv. And in fact, if you look at very low frequencies where we expect there to be a gravitational wave background, there is something that is standing up above the noise. We don't know what that is yet. We are not claiming that this is a gravitational wave background. But there is something manifesting at low frequencies. There's a common amplitude and power law behavior in all 45 of nanograv's millisecond pulsars. And in fact, the EPTA and the Parks Pulsar Timing Array have now both released papers that show similar behavior in their pulsar timing arrays. And so right now, with the International Pulsar Timing Array, we're assembling a brand new data release, which combines Nanograv's 15-year data with their most recent data to really see if we are all, in fact, seeing the same kind of common behavior in all of our pulsars. So I said earlier, when we were looking for the, um, when we were defining the characteristic strain, that it would go like f to the minus 2 thirds. Now, that's for supermassive black holes. So when we use gamma here, what we're just doing is seeing what the overall behavior of this cross power spectral density is. So uh, the characteristic strain squared goes like 
f to the minus alpha and then you have another f term here so minus three and so that combined frequency dependence is called gamma and here the subscript cp means common process so if we don't demand that the frequency go like f to the minus two thirds, we open ourselves up to all sorts of physics that could be generating nanohertz gravitational waves, you know, in the pulsar timing array band. So while our cherished belief is that this should be from supermassive black hole binaries, there could in fact be other really interesting physical processes that are generating nanohertz gravitational waves. So if you look um, at just the power law dependence here, which is the orange dash line, um, that translates into these contours here, which are the orange dash contours, supermassive black holes um, are right here. Now, if you demand that, you know, you don't just use the lowest five frequency bins where you expect there to be a gravitational wave background, you need to use all of the frequency bins and it has to be a power law that's this green uh, dot dashed line here which translates um, into these contours on the right hand side. Now, one thing that I think is my favorite solution is to say well you can just have a broken power law, you can say that you know at low frequencies you're going to have some sort of power law behavior at high frequencies, maybe you have a power law behavior, but you need to allow it to turn over. And so what you can see with the blue line is that at high frequencies, you're just looking at noise, right? This just looks like white noise. You have a flat behavior. There's nothing really happening at high frequencies, but that's okay. You expect that on two, from two different levels. On the first level is astrophysically. You don't expect there to be a strong stochastic background at the higher frequencies because the stochasticity of the background should be breaking down. The supermassive black hole mergers that were taking 25 million years to go from one to 100 nanohertz are now, you know, something like 100 years away from merging at 100 nanohertz. So there's not so many sources at the high frequencies. Secondly, at high frequencies, it means that you have short data spans for your pulsars. And so those aren't really good enough um, to give you uh, a good handle on the signal that you're looking for. So if I demand, and, and I do, um, to say that we have not yet detected gravitational waves, then a fair question is, well, then what are you looking at? But the answer is that just because we don't know for sure that it's gravitational waves, it doesn't mean that it's not, but we're, we just can't make such a claim without having our extraordinary evidence. We thought that we were in this situation with the 11-year data, for example, Right, so we've had our own false alarm. And what happened with the nanograv 11 year data is that we saw this beautiful orange peak in the PDF of the amplitude of the gravitational wave background. And that was using a solar system ephemeris called DE430. Now, if you don't know what uh, solar system ephemerides are, you're not alone. I didn't know what these were before we started to dig into the nanograv 11 year data. But basically, this tells you the masses of the planets and where they are in their orbits. And we didn't know initially that NASA was giving us these uh, ephemerides for different space missions, um, but that, in fact, every new release was not necessarily an improvement. They have a very engineering mindset. And so they have one set of ephemerides that are optimized for Mars, one for Jupiter. Uh, one for different planetary missions where they get, you know, as good as they need to get and then they stop. And so we found that when we use different ephemerides that the gravitational wave background signal kind of faded away. So what gives? How can we simultaneously have and not have a gravitational wave signal with an 11 year data set? Well, those of you who still remember your fundamental astronomy or even took an astronomy class, I didn't until grad school, might know that the period of Jupiter is very close to 11 years. And in fact, any kind of small error in the period or the mass of Jupiter would give us a signal that looked almost exactly like a gravitational wave background signal because it was a correlated noise that was strong, that was in all of the pulsars 
because we used these solar system ephemeris models to move all of the pulsar arrival times to the solar system very center. And so what you can visualize this as is all of the pulsar arrival times now circulating around the true solar system very center, giving a correlated signal that looks, you know, for all intents and purposes, like a gravitational wave background. So Michele Valisneri got together and led an effort to correct for this effect. It's called Bayes FM. And when applied, you get these solid lines, and now you can use any ephemeris model you like and get the same answer. So that's good. So it's definitely not Jupiter anymore. And in fact, why should we only use American um, uh, solar system ephemeris models? So we then uh, reached out to the European Space Agency and have INPOP. So this is uh, this similar thing, their solar system ephemeris values from ESA. And we now in the 12 and a half year data set looked for this gravitational wave background signal both with a fixed solar system ephemeris error and also using Bayes FM. Now, because Michele's Bayes FM model is trying to get rid of signals like Jupiter that inject a red noise, what can happen is that the amplitude of the background that you're potentially able to detect is lower because this is eating away at some of your signal, right? It's not a perfect model. And so if it sees red noise, it's going to dig away at that. So you can see that Bayes FM for both DE438, which is the new ephemeris from the Juno mission, and MPOP19, both their amplitudes are decreased when you turn them on compared to a fixed model. But what makes you kind of jump out of your skin is that this is a beautiful looking detection of a correlated red noise process. Um, so this, I think, is really beautiful. And here the amplitude is a few times 10 to the minus 15. So it's about two times 10 to the minus 15. This is really the point of the paper um, that we published late last year, that there is something that has the same amplitude in all of the pulsars and the same kind of spectral behavior. Um, but is it the gravitational wave background yet? Well, we need to see the second part of the cross correlations, the Hellings and Downs curve, or this correlation function. So I'm going to animate um, by just kind of moving back and forth, going from the nanograv 11 year data to the nanograv 12 and a half year data. And so do we see uh, a marked difference? So first you should look at how the error bars change in the Y axis. And you'll also notice that there's error bars on the X axis. That's because we bin the data. And so going from 11 years to 12 and a half years, you'll notice that the binning changes slightly. And so those error bars are also going to shift. So the Hellings and Downs curve is in blue, which is what we expect for um, an isotropic Einsteinian background. You're not going to be shocked now that this has a y-axis value of 10 to the minus 30, because the typical value that we expect is 10 to the minus 15. And when we do the cross correlations, we get this amplitude squared times the correlation function. So anything um, here is a perfectly reasonable number for an expected value of 10 to the minus 15 for the amplitude of the background. All right, so this is the 11 year data and this is the 12 and a half year data. And then this is the 11 year data and the 12 and a half year data. So the orange line is a monopole. Like what if there is some sort of additional noise term that's in all of the pulsars that does not follow the gravitational wave quadrupolar like shape. So this is 12, again 11, and then 12. So it's certainly looking a lot better, um, but you'll probably want to be a little bit more convinced um, than just looking at me going through this little animation. So what is the actual evidence for the Hellings and Downs curve? So we made this, this, this basogram, and um, again, Michele Valisneri made this for the 12 and a half year paper, um, asking some really interesting Bayesian questions. So what is the evidence for there being a common amplitude process? We're not saying what is sourcing that, but there's something that has the same amplitude, it's generating red noise in all of the pulsars, versus this being only intrinsic pulsar noise. 
So the base factor for this is 10 to the 4.5 to 1, right? Or a log base factor of 4.5. When you turn on base FM, you still get a factor of 100 to 1 for there being some sort of common amplitude process um, in all of the pulsars versus it just being noise. So we know that there's something there. There's strong evidence for something that has an amplitude of about 2 times 10 to the minus 15 uh, that has a gamma value of 13 thirds, which is supermassive black holes. Now, what if we go further? I'll just point out a few of these two. We're not going to stay here too long. So is there evidence for the spatial correlations for the Hellings and Downs curve? Well, this is very weak. This is a factor of a few to one, right, for the Hellings and Downs curve. So we still don't know if it's there or not with the 12 and a half year data. Then we can say, well, what if it's just some sort of other correlated noise that's in the pulsars? This is really disfavored. Um, and what if it's, you know, another solar system ephemeris error? This is also disfavored. So but the really fun thing about this kind of figure for the Bayesians in the audience is that you can go through and add up all of these uh, base factors and then figure out like what's the evidence for your favorite um, process that's happening in the pulsar timing array data. But right now it looks like it's just some sort of, well, right now the most evidence is for the Hellings and Downs curve um, and a common amplitude process which is of course the gravitational wave background, but the evidence right now is still really weak for those, for those both terms being there. There's strong evidence for the amplitude, the characteristic strain, but we don't yet have the Hellings and Downs curve. So what's next? Well, we have 15 years of data. That uh, paper was written with 12 and a half years of data. And these 15 years of data uh, go right up to the collapse of Arecibo. So while we will miss Arecibo terribly, we in fact were already working with data that were two and a half years old by the time that it collapsed. So now we have a 15 year data set that has 68 millisecond pulsars. Timing baselines are between three and 15 years. And now we're going to look at the data and see if the signal to noise ratio or the evidence for the common process is increasing and is the evidence for the Hellings and Downs curve also increasing. So this timing analysis is important. And we're also trying to uh, accelerate it because we're all very excited by preliminary results. So what's next? Well, we hope to learn about the supermassive black hole binary population from this characteristic strain. Right now, this blue line uh, right here, this is the area that is favored by the amplitude that's detected in the 12 and a half year data. So if it were a gravitational wave background, uh, the models for the gravitational wave background that are consistent with this um, so far is only the study that was done by Alberto Cezana in 2013, um, which was a more of a Monte Carlo range of simulations. He basically did you know, thousands of realizations of all different sorts of backgrounds and gave some sort of uh, parameter range for the amplitude of the background. And some of those realizations are consistent with what we're seeing in the 12 and a half year data. You can also see that there was a lot of effort done to look for very low amplitude gravitational wave backgrounds. And that's because after you know, doing this experiment for over a decade, we were starting to sweat we were like, why isn't there a signal in the data yet? What could possibly be suppressing the data? And so there have been, uh, there's been a lot of effort dedicated to, you know, looking for evidence for less massive supermassive black holes, or perhaps all of the supermassive black holes stall. Do they only merge with three body interactions? All of these things have been discovered, but in fact, in the end might be completely unnecessary because we potentially have a whopping loud signal. So what else can we learn? Well, you could also say, given the fact that I know that the characteristic strain is a function of black hole mass, the number density of supermassive black holes, and the volume that encloses the background, this redshift Z, can't I just take this amplitude that we've measured and now project it onto these three axes? 
And in fact, you can. So my student, Andrew Casey Clyde, just had his first paper accepted here, where it looks like the volume of the background is constrained to within a redshift of two and a half, which is very reasonable, that the minimum black hole mass that contributes to the gravitation wave background is about 10 to the eight solar masses. Um, and this is all true for a strain of 1.9 times 10 to the minus 15. So what else is next? Well, the detection of individual supermassive black hole binaries. Together with another student, Chung Chung Chin and Jeff Hasboon, um, we generated a population of pulsars in the galaxy based on a paper by Keen et al, who went in and described how many pulsars we expect to find with SKA mid and low, then uh, SKA one, and then the full SKA. And so what we found is that there are potentially periodic light curves that are associated with active galactic nuclei that could be hosting supermassive black hole binary systems. And so there were a few that we zoomed in on that are shown with these markers here. And by populating the sky with pulsars that we hope to find by 2025 with IPTA and then SKA1 and SKA2, um, we believe that we might be able to find up to 12 supermassive black hole binaries by the end of the decade. Now, what's important here for anyone who's interested in looking for individual binary systems is that by knowing the sky location of a potential binary, you can improve your strain by a factor of at least two. And if you are actually looking at the periodic light curve, and if that period really does trace the binary, then you can get up to an order of magnitude improvement in uh, your estimate for the strain. So this is really crucially important. And a lot of people have been working on trying to figure out how we can use all of this multi-messenger information. The next thing that's next is going beyond the Hellings and Downs curve. So what we assume for Hellings and Downs, and this is a paper that was published in 1983, is that the background is isotropic. I mean, that's fine because, you know, say that the background really is sourced by gravitational wave sources that are all the way out to redshift of two or beyond, then it's a fair assumption to assume that it's isotropic. But if you have these nearby sources, right, these nearby individual sources, then these could add anisotropy into the gravitational wave background. And so instead of your correlation functions looking like Hellings and Downs, um, you get all of these different spaghetti curves, right? So instead of having uh, just the monopole, you can decompose the gravitational wave background onto a basis of spherical harmonics, like what's done in CMB searches, and now look for these higher order monopoles. And so here, uh, you know, this spaghetto is for a dipole, and then you can look for a quadrupole, and you can look for whatever you like. Uh, in the LIGO band, this is also done by Eric Thrain. Now, if you have a breathing mode, which is very exciting, uh, a departure or an additional polarization, um, it would look something like this, this uh, green dashed line. So this red line is the Hellings and Downs curve just to guide your eye, but a breathing mode would look totally different. And so what else is important is continuing to build more detectors. So Arecibo collapsed on December 1st, 2020. And to keep our experiments going, we have restructured our observing programs and now include CHIME and the Very Large Array. There's also um, instrumental upgrades that are planned on coming online in early 2022. And the uh, NGVLA, the uh, DSA 2000 telescope, and a possible future observatory where Arecibo was are all possible. I want to just say about the telescopes that pulsar timing arrays are going to be around for a long time. There's no single point of failure. If we lose a telescope, even one as important as Arecibo, we still have 10 more all over the world that can continue the experiment. 
So the next telescope that's going to be really important is Meerkat and the SKA. So I have more slides on cosmology if you're interested in that, but if you're not, I think I should let you go um, and just give you a summary. First of all, email me if you think that this is fun and you would like to play with us in Nanograv and explore your, uh, your models with the Nanograv data. There's something in the Nanograv 12 and a half year data. There's a common amplitude and spectral index in all 45 of the pulsars. And this is also seen now in EPTA and PPTA analyses that were led by Si Yuan Chen and Boris Goncharov. So is it evidence for the background? If so, the detection is imminent and we should be able to find local sources in a few years and be able to measure anisotropy in the background shortly and then port everything that we've done from pulsar timing to LISA. So what's next? Really everything is next. And this is like the CMB in the pre-detection era. I think it's gonna be really exciting. So thank you for your attention. Hi, Kiara, thank you for this uh, awesome talk. Um, so when you showed how that 11 year signal was just Jupiter, um, I was sort of holding my head because my yeah, so mind is we. not, Huh? So were we. Yeah, I bet. So, um, I mean, how can, so, I mean, how can you be sure that, shouldn't you be blinding out the frequencies of all the things that go at, you know, anything that's big enough to have a, have a period that you could detect Saturn and all the other things, I don't know, seismic stuff in the sun with weird long hydrodynamic cycles, like, where does it stop? Mm -hmm. Like, do you know, uh, yeah. do you know enough about local solar system stuff? Well, uh, so this is a really interesting point. Like if you think about the LIGO curves, they have all of these lines that go through the yeah, noise yeah. sources, right? Um, before the 11 year data, nobody thought that solar system ephemeris errors was gonna be an issue for a few reasons. Number one, no one thought that it was that bad. Number two, um, that a solar system ephemeris error should be a dipole. Right, it should be that you have the center of the solar system here. I'm balancing it on the tip of my finger, and if there's an error in where that is, and the TOAs or the time of arrivals all circulate it, so it should be a dipole. It shouldn't be a quadrupole. So it shouldn't be picked up um, by the gravitational wave background search. But there was so much signal that it leaked into the quadrupole, <laughs> and we didn't <laughs> think that that was possible. But it's possible. <laughs> and, and, uh, what and so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, um, that's why we we spend so much time digging into this because you know you, you have to be really sure before you make an announcement. And it was a really intense uh, few months, you know, looking under all of the stones. But it's a good thing that we did it. And and um, and I guess is there any way that um, just because the sun is so much of our solar system's mass, is there any way that the sun's internal processes could ever? mess with us on the scale i don't know star quakes or something or i don't know i'm, I'm saying very naive things so, but yeah i mean it's a it's a an interesting thought right and and right now it looks like the worst thing that the sun can do is to inject additional plasma into the solar system and as the earth goes through it it messes up the pulsar timing so solar winds and things like this oh, okay. uh can, can, can in fact mess up pulsar timing. And Jeff Hasboon, uh, postdoc is about to release an update to um, constraints and things that we can learn about the sun through pulsar timing through those kinds of processes. Uh, Dusty Madison was the first one to do it a couple of years ago. So um, there are some things that we can learn, but remember that we're looking for things that happen on a time scale of decades right. um, that could be ultra low frequencies. So I think, but who knows what the future holds. But I think right now, the main effect of the sun is to shoot out stuff okay. into space that affects the electron number density, right? And the column that you look at towards the pulsar. So then you okay. can mess up okay. how much you think the signal is dispersed. Okay, Th thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions inside the room? Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I mean, I just have a naive question. So if this common red process is not a gravitational wave, um, is there any idea what that could be? I mean, I know that one needs the quadrupole correlation to be, to be proved, but 
um, as it is, this common common process, does it have any reasonable explanation otherwise? No, the short answer is no. There's nothing that anyone has been able to think about that could be causing this. Um, people are starting to try to invent theories at this point to try to explain it, um, but that's a dangerous road. So right now there's no other known or accepted kind of physical process that's happening inside pulsars that could generate this kind of signal. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else here or on Zoom? Okay, if not, we can thank Chiara again. Thank you all and have a Campari spritz for me.